would now like to call on Sheldon Levy, President and Vice Chancellor of Ryerson University and Chair, Council of Ontario Universities. Sheldon will introduce the Honourable Glenn Murray, Minister of Research and Innovation, who is providing today's keynote address. Well, thank you, and it's uh, great for me to be here, and it's an honour to uh, be able to introduce the Minister, and I have to say that uh, walking around is a thrill, and it's always exciting to see not only my colleagues here and what they are doing on the innovation scene, but seeing so many uh, here and uh, seeing the ideas that will be the uh, strength of our economy for years to come. But today, right now, I have the distinct pleasure to introduce the Honourable Glenn Murray. To many of you, he's the Minister of Research and Innovation, but to us here in Toronto Centre, he's Glenn, our local MPP. Minister Murray has proven to be an advocate in the realm of innovation. After only coming to this position in August, he has already covered a lot of territory in a very short time and has expressed a lot of ideas and views in that time as well. Minister Murray launched the All Regional Innovation Centres across Ontario and maintains connections with all colleges and universities. We can see that Minister Murray is a tireless champion for those who share values of social justice, human rights, and a sustainable world and future. He sees this through his work in communities across Canada and his commitment to his constituents in Toronto Centre and as well to the people of Ontario as Minister of Research and Innovation. It is with great pleasure that I have the honour to introduce our next speaker, the Honourable Glenn Murray. Thank you very much. Thanks uh, very much, (coughs) Sheldon. It's uh, great to have leaders like you in the academic circle. I've always said, uh, well, many people take on the presidency of universities to build great universities. Sheldon's taken it on to do more than that. Uh, He's certainly doing that, but to build a great city, uh, which is what I'm particularly proud of, uh, that we are a community where people don't just simply look at their job descriptions, but actually look at the quality of their citizenship and do more than vote or pay taxes, but actually look at how they can make a difference in the world. And Sheldon, you are inspiring many young people and many of us old farts uh, in that effort, so thank you. I want to thank uh, uh, my ministry staff, and in particular, I want to thank my, uh, my dear friends, Sean Conway and Tom Corr at the Ontario Centres of Excellence uh, for the extraordinary leadership they're providing uh, and helping pull together what I think has been an extraordinary dynamic uh, group of events this week uh, that have inspired and educated us at the same time. So Sean and Tom, thank you very much as well. I have a few more important thank yous before I, I get into the, the substance of my speech, but uh, did many of you see the, the, uh, the speed mentoring event? That was so cool. I walked in here and I had all these young, very bright folks with more disposable income than I have in their own businesses as a 24. Um, I, I graduated from university with a debt. These guys are graduating with companies. It's just frightening. <laughs> but I want to thank uh, the speed mentors. Uh, who brought wisdom, thought, and understanding and a bit of confidence to those young folks who are nervous, who have a bright idea and are entering the world of trying to access markets and capital uh, and and develop uh, distribution plans and development plans. Uh, So to Charlotte Burke, the president of Asurion Canada, Tom Corr, who I mentioned earlier, Peter Evans, advisor at IT Communications and Entertainment at the Mars Discovery District. Mark Fauscher, BlackBerry Partners Fund. Tom Jenkins, the extraordinary founder and executive chairman of that great company, OpenText. Justin Lafayette, the managing director of Georgian Capital Partners, such an important uh, group formulating capital here. Tim Lee, the chief invested officer of venture capital at GrowthWorks. Mark McCardle, executive in residence at Communitech in Kitchener. Jackie Murphy, who the, is a partner at Tech Capital. 
Capital Partners, our dear friend and innovator, Nick Parker, the chairman of Cleantech Group, uh, Dr. Elsa Trunick, uh, the CEO of Mars Discovery Center. I don't know how she found time this week to do that, but she was a mentor as well, as well as Sharat Bat uh, from Extreme Venture Partners. These folks gave up a lot of their time today uh, to connect with some young emerging minds and, and, and make some very dynamic new businesses successful. So if we could have a round of applause for all of them and their generosity. <clears throat> You, you probably know a little bit about the Ontario Centres of Excellence. They just in the last year have invested almost $26 million in 503 projects. Uh, these projects attracted over $40 million from industry partners. They involve 40 colleges, universities and research hospitals. Uh, and they connected with 757 companies. This, in one year alone, the activities of OCE started 20 new startup companies that attracted a further $113 million in capital investments. And if you look at their partners like the Mars uh, Medical and Related Research Centers or Communitech or Information Factory or Oakry, uh, we have more than one startup walking in and out of the doors of each of those centers almost every day right now. And this network of excellence, uh, the network of moving decisions about the emerging urban regional economies back to those communities is paying off uh, in a way that I think many of us never imagined, par uh, never imagined. But I want to talk today not so much about government programs, uh, nor do I want to spend a lot of time talking about particular companies. I, I want us, I'd like to have a chance to try and explain to you, as I think the, the Premier McGuinty did yesterday, I think very articulately at lunch, some of the whys as well as the whats of what we're doing. How we in Ontario see where we are, where we come from. And to try and put some context to uh, the government, government initiatives and the philosophy and understanding we have of the changes going on and the leadership role that we are trying to play, that we understand we're being asked to play, and how the partnerships are coming together for the leadership role that many of you need to play, or we hope you will play with us. I always uh, think you take a marker from when you were born. Uh, I was born in 1957, uh, so I know a lot about Chevrolets. Um, I know only, the only people laughing in the room are old people now, I know that. Uh, in 1957 was arguably the height of the first round of the emergence as Canada as a major production economy. Two-thirds of us lived in cities, and interestingly, two-thirds of us in 1957 made things for a living. We were one of the most successful production economies of the 20th century. At that time, with roughly 20 million people, uh, we had built an auto sector and through partnerships with the United States. Uh, and if you lived in communities in Ontario, you did very different things. If you lived in Kitchener, there was no research in motion or open text. You probably made shoes or boots at Kaufman's. If you were in Cornwall, you worked at Domtar. Uh, and if you were in St. Catharines, you worked at the GM plant. Uh, you made things. And that production economy, as Conrad Hilton said, had three important business decisions that you always had to make. Location, location, location. Uh, your proximity to the mine head, to uh, critical transportation infrastructure, your relative position to an immediate first world market, and government industrial policy governed from the frontier. We governed from the edge. Our most powerful, powerful tools were things like tariffs, barriers at our border that, that increased the price of imports, marketing boards, things like the national energy policy, the federal investment review policy that fussed about ownership and fussed about trying to find ways to reduce the cost domestically of the price of, a, of the goods out of a production economy. And most of us think about that as our economy. It is even hard today when you go into a small community like Silicon, like, like, like St. Catharines, where companies like Silicon Knights and digital media companies you know, have waiting lists and have shortages for trying to find employees, forget, for people to understand that these new jobs in old buildings in downtown St. Catharines are playing three and four times what the old assembly line jobs at the GM plant paid. But people can see a smokestack. They can see an assembly plant. They think about that as real economic development. And it is hard in the new dynamics of this new global economy 
to make the case as elected officials for the new economy because it is not as immediately visible. When it shows up in your community, it doesn't come with a whole lot of big infrastructure, a plant and a smokestack. It is imperceptible and a lot of it doesn't really sound like real work. But what has emerged is a very different economy. My friend Kevin Lynch recently in a piece called Innovation or Perish, I think described it very well. He said, you know, the world has emerged from the global financial crisis, but just as it was not a typical recession, it will not be a typical recovery. There is no gently winding path back to pre-recession status quo. The world has changed and is moving on. The world is now flatter, more interconnected, more wired, and more competitive than imaginable just a decade ago. Pervasive globalization has created global capital markets, global supply chains, global information markets, and global labor markets for highly qualified personnel. The internationalization of science and technology means OECD countries are losing their monopoly in cr on creating new products and developing new technologies. You can also see it in the unevenness of this recovery. Here in Ontario, we have 114% job recovery. 60% of those jobs, according to uh, CIBC, are what are called high-value, high-knowledge jobs, very different than they were before. We had 3.4% GDP growth, which is amazing compared to most of Western Europe and the Americas. Looks a little peaked compared to Singapore's 14.7%. And the emergence of Asian state capitalist countries are extraordinarily important because the dynamics of their democracy and the dynamics of their economy allow the consolidation of capital very quickly, the retention of talent, and the building of R&D infrastructure and the hardwiring of innovation to production in a way that's hard to do in market, mixed market economies and pluralistic democracies. And it is a challenge to the political institutions and to business leaders who operate in these more complex, consensus-based, sometimes slow-to-move economies to compete with the emerging state capitalist economies. It challenges. The pace of change in the economy is almost impossible for traditional decision-making structures in the private or public sector to keep up. And, and what it's interesting to see the power and priorities placed on efficacy and outcome and results in many emerging Asian democracies that have, urged, that have emerged with a very different ethic and set of priorities than the mixed market Western economies as we struggle with that. So in the United States, depending on whose numbers you use, we're looking at 11%, 14%, 20% uh, job recovery, a fairly weak GDP growth, and a challenge for us in Ontario. 80% of the cars we make here are sold in the United States. I always remember as a child, my father running to the Wall Street Journal. He owned a small entrepreneurial business and always would reassure me when things were bad and my mom by looking at the Wall Street Journal and said, it said things I did not understand when I was eight year old. Glenn, consumer confidence is up in the United States. This is good. Glenn, housing prices are up in the United States. And he would go through these numbers that my father understood in his business, which was a distribution and marketing uh, business that, that handled uh, the, the, the issues and challenges of many uh, manufacturers. Uh, I immediately you know, sort of understood that dad knew things were going to be all right. So here we are in the first recession uh, that my, my friend Kevin Lynch describes, I think, accurately as a very different kind of recession with no U.S. recovery. And pretty darn close right now in Ontario to a full recovery. We have never been able in this regional economy to emerge from a recession, certainly not full employment recovery, without the U.S. So I'm very optimistic about the future because I do believe that I hear President Obama saying things that our Premier said five years ago going into this about the importance of innovation as a dynamic process for wealth generation in, the, in his most recent speech. And I think the, the leadership of the President of the United States now is giving us great hope that the huge and brilliant entrepreneurial spirit of discovery and invention to our, and our neighbors to the south is now re-emerging uh, and, and, and changes in, in, in things like stem cell research and life sciences and genomics will give us a much more dynamic and as we've now seen in California and Massachusetts as regional economies that are outperforming most other states. Here it's critical. According to the federal government's recent study, 4.4 percent 
of Canadian companies, the ones that are the small and medium enterprise companies that are hardwired into innovation, that have reinvented an entirely new value proposition along with, an, uh, with finding new partners, sometimes larger companies that more quickly access global markets, are producing 50% of the jobs that have emerged in Canada. This little sliver of the Ontario economy, these precious, what uh, my uh, <clears throat> one person who's inspired me, Rick Spence, if you fo don't follow him in the National Post, you should, refers to as gazelles. These gazelles, these dynamic companies are emerging with a level of sophistication, with a level of job creation, and with some real challenges. And this is why the Ontario Centers of Excellence, our Ontario Venture Capital Fund, OETF, and many of the other partnership organizations are tuned to try and meet these goals. These growth companies are swamped with challenges, raising capital, balancing cash flows, investing in research and development, finding IT, business and staff sales, building a disciplined but engaging co company culture, dealing in foreign markets, and masterminding all of the opening overseas offices and offenses. The National Post is of a different political philosophy than our party in government, but Rick Spence has been heaping praise on our government for these actions. Uh, and it's interesting that our alignment with things like the HST, which have put eight and a half billion dollars back into the hands of most of these small emerging economies for investments in technology and investments in talent. I was with about 17 CEOs in Kitchener of our emerging technologies, and I said to them, what is the best economic development initiative you've seen? They said the coherence between the provincial government and the federal government on tax reform, the opening up and the courage to stand up for difficult tax reform that has dealt changes to consumption taxes, the removal of heavy taxation on assembled parts, and I give Jim Flaherty huge, huge credit for that because our blackberries are now made in about 18 or 19 different companies, and the realization that Ontario works best when you remove trade barriers and tax barriers to the assembly of parts and the, the attachment uh, of production to innovation. But we have huge challenges. And if I had a call out to you today for one thing to take on with us, what I think will be a mandate that we need to ask for, and I was desperately saddened and, and, and that it wasn't a bigger issue in the federal election because it's a word that is hard to get your head around if you're a working family. It's called productivity. We have a lot to learn from our American friends. Our productivity gap with the U.S. is 25 percent right now. The infrastructure that I talked about, the pools of capital, the enabling mechanisms, the mentorship, the moving all of this expertise back to community level decision making is not just to help accelerate the startups in Ontario, it's not just to help the, the grow ups that are coming up and the stay up innovation companies, it's not just to do what we have accomplished now which is to be number two to California in direct foreign investment, it is to take on the productivity challenge. We invest heavily in design works at U of T. Design Works has now done the innovation strategies for 17 of the largest companies in North America. Procter and Gamble had its innovation and productivity strategy designed at Design Works only a few blocks from here. We haven't gotten a single Canadian company to go through that process. I'm working very closely with my deputy and with many of my colleagues, George Ross, who I've got some very innovative leaders in our, within our public sector to look at how we take on the, the challenge of productivity. How do we adapt technology? Can we have digital driver's license and health care cards? Can we remove a lot of the analog bureaucracy and costly systems that we no longer need? When I was mayor of Winnipeg, I was endorsed by the left and the right. I took the city from 11,800 to 8,300 employees, produced more affordable housing, more culture, more arts, more police officers, and got more road construction done than in the history with a smaller platform of staff because we used an e-government strategy and technology and we pushed a lot of stuff back to community, back to partnerships, and back to the private sector. And if you look at large regional economies like London and the government, I think the City of London now has something like 60, 70 percent of its city services now run through great and dynamic partnerships with the private sector because the amount of technology and innovation required to manage a public agenda today simply can't be found within the abilities and the constructs of government. I'm very proud that our ministry, I think, was just about the first, if or certainly in the first handful in North America to do this social innovation wiki project where we had courageous public servants who had to give up a bit of power. We had to work and facilitate expertise outside of government to write an innovation policy in government, and the Premier referenced that before. 
We have to now, and that didn't cost us anything. And it did create a lot of opportunities for a lot of companies and the, from Moxie right on through to, to many others that now have created a new wealth generating set of businesses around knowledge innovation and public policy. This very idea of innovation is critical. Because when I talked about 1957 before, and I talked about production being the major, the activity in the economy that generated wealth, it is now innovation. Innovation has replaced production as the major source of wealth. The reason I came back into politics a year ago was because I really believe that Premier McGuinty is one of the few political leaders in the world that actually understands what that fundamentally means. That you have to rethink your infrastructure budgets. That you have to put, create 200,000 new seats in our universities, which we've just done, and another 60,000 more coming. To give you an idea of how big that is, one of our largest universities, one of the largest in North America, U of T, is over 75,000. This is more, this is about two and a half universities of Toronto we've added to the system. We have refocused in international scholarships. And while we have about $2 billion in student aid and scholarships for our own students and cap student debt at 7,300, we have now got international partnerships. This year alone, $30 million in scholarships for elite PhD students from, uh, from China and from India. We have put $3.6 billion into R&D in direct funded, in peer reviewed, I think some of the most recognized uh, process for approving that. And we have wrapped that around to avoid bureaucracy with CFI and our friends of the federal government who have been providing us with a very highly collaborative platform on which to accelerate that. Not only have we put $8.5 billion back in the, in, in the HST in cutting taxes at the very core of, at the point of investment in talent and innovation, we've also reduced small business taxes by 5.3 billion dollars and personal income tax by 10.3 billion dollars. Our corporate tax rates now are six, seven, eight points below the 35 percent corporate tax rate in the United States, which immediately removes the friction for most large investment. We have a stable political democracy, but we've also taken risks. The feed-in tariff program, which Al Gore referenced as one of the best, has, has now in the last 10 years with its predecessor initiatives from our government and from previous governments has now arrived with over 3,000 clean tech jobs and 65,000, sorry, 3,000 clean tech companies and 65,000 jobs. This hardly existed a decade ago. These are those, these are largely, this is a large flock or a large herd of gazelles might be the better word for it. 65,000. That is more people than work in the auto sector. And we've just, the General Motors and Chrysler, bless their souls, have just paid back their loans to us five years ahead of schedule. They have created, they have added the 8,000 jobs back that they've, they, they've laid, but they're still in totality a smaller industry now than the 65,000 in our clean tech. And we have a very important debate here. It's, it was interesting to me that the fractioning of the Conservative Party in this country has been very concerning to me. Because while the Liberals and, and the Conservatives federally both agreed on this basic proposition of tax reform, the only party I can find that doesn't support that is the Conservative Party in opposition to us, that wants to destroy the HST, put $8.5 billion back, return us to a cascading sales tax, blow up our international agreements like Samsung, which will put a chill through the international investment markets, because all you have to do is go to Linamar or Magna, talk to Liz and Linda Hassenfrass or any of those folks, uh, or, the, or, or Frank Stronach, to understand how important the supply chain that gets created by a GM or by a Ford. And the Toyotas and Hondas who came to us and were the first companies almost to say, bail out the Americans because we need the supply chain. Samsung creates a supply chain. I was down in the Niagara region where about 80% of our renewable energy is produced right now. And if you want to see some pretty exciting local grassroots work, read the uh, joint submission and the joint strategy done by all of the chambers of commerce in small towns through Niagara, St. Catharines, Fort Erie, Niagara Falls, on the numbers of companies that have emerged in the Niagara region that have now meant that that wine-growing tourism region now has a dynamic third pillar it never thought it could have. And we, we need the investments by the Ontario Power Authority, who are now doing clean energy mapping and community energy strategy. Do you know how much they saved in Calgary? And I was one of the team leaders on that. Calgary's clean energy plan, by mapping out energy demand and use and looking at how you structure the right technology, whether it's district energy, CHPs, passive solar, they save $32 billion over the next 25 years in avoidable costs by changing their city plan and, and re 
configuring that. And we'll be not the first. We have to let Alberta get one or two things ahead of us. But we'll be probably the second to actually have that dynamic mapping. And when you put that together with our feed-in tariff program, we are going to accelerate in ways that you haven't. But all of these changes come back to this idea that innovation now is the major source of wealth generation. That talent moves around the world very quickly. There was a study in the U.S. that said the average talent worker, knowledge worker, spends less than three years in a city and one year in a job. And they usually use a, leave a company to start their own company. So people have become incredibly, incredibly sophisticated consumers of place. These people can live anywhere in the world that they want. They move, as Thomas Friedman said, in the world is flat. When the world is flat, a brilliant book. You can plug and play anywhere in the world. It is literally the we are living in the first generation where we where billions of dollars of capital can move around the world in split seconds. And we saw that in the recession when countries like Ireland and countries like Iceland had the highest per capita G GDP and some of the most dynamic innovation economies in design and in business design collapsed. So resiliency is important. Diversity is important. But I want to go back to productivity because productivity is where all this comes together. It is the relationship between innovation and production. It is our ability to adapt innovation to every production and service function, period to get your productivity ahead. And if, in my ministry, and I know with my, my friend Sandra Pupatello, we are looking at every water treatment plant as an opportunity to demonstrate and create markets and international platforms for new membrane technology, new UV technology. Our partnerships with GE and our hospitals, like Mount Sinai, have turned our hospitals in not just to creating better health outcomes, better pathology that, that reduces almost to zero misdiagnosis of breast cancer and incredibly important things that we're confronted with in testing. It has created a new platform for new businesses and new technologies that are tested and developed to improve health outcomes outcomes and to build global markets. Your assembly here today and this conference is the other and final piece of it and I and my Premier and our government are extremely indebted to you. We are trying to build a very dynamic, culturally rich cities that are exciting places to live. Civil rights based societies where everybody's difference isn't a cause for concern or tolerance, it's a cause for celebration. In this region, there are five and a half million people in the city of Toronto, over 1.2 Indo-Canadian -speaker, Indo -Canadian speakers who speak everything from Tamil to Punjabi, and 1.2 million people who speak Cantonese and Mandarin. We are the most complex multicultural society in the world, and we're a series of urban regional economies that are second to none. We see our partnerships with Singapore, with Israel, with the United States, with regions in France and the Netherlands and China, not as competition but as collaboration, that we are trying to lift each other up, that the synergies of global companies and local companies are extremely positive, the mobility and, and of capital and of talent is extraordinary, and we don't want to pay, have competition simply to keep it all here, but to be part of a dynamic constellation across this planet of, of dynamic regional economies that solve our water challenges, eliminate the problems where people have not enough water to grow food, to move knowledge and education to advance our, our, the productivity of our economy and the civility of our governments. And I know all of you have a very multi-dimensional view of the world and your companies, and you see yourselves much more than just academics or business leaders, but as global citizens. And one of the great things in Canada we are so proud of is to be a Canadian is not just to be a citizen of this country. Today it requires you to be a citizen of the world. And in my little constituency where there's 168 different languages spoken of which you're in the middle of right now, we take that as a great source of pride. So I hope if you're visiting from afar, you won't just be a visitor, you'll feel far part of this complex, multicultural, dynamic community here in Canada and its, its economic capital. We hope you'll feel welcome, you'll come back often, and we are deeply, deeply grateful to you for the contributions you've made economically and socially, culturally to our success, and we hope we can return it to each of you many fold and that you go home to dynamic and successful communities and that we build a better planet to better, better planet together. God bless and keep you safe. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ilse Trionicht from Mars, and it's my great pleasure to thank uh, Minister Murray for um, his call to action. Um, he has put innovation not just in the middle of work, he's put it in the middle of uh, community and in the middle of uh, uh, the mission of our country. And uh, it is that bigger view, I think, 
Um, that means that innovation uh, stretches far beyond the next cool gadget, but actually uh, allows us to emotionally also commit to that agenda. Uh, Minister, you have the foot soldiers here. We're already in. We're believers. And uh, it's the partnership between the work that goes on from people in this room um, and our, um, our public sector leaders that uh, will allow us to um, face the enormous challenges that are ahead for humanity and for our society, but also to build a vibrant economy for our children and grandchildren. Thank you very much for being here, and good luck.